Hi, my name is Eric Notmeyer from Mayo Clinic, Florida Department of Neurosurgery. I'm going to be talking about management of cervical epidural abscess, indications for surgery, timing of surgery, and medical legal considerations. These are my disclosures. So the incidence of cervical epidural abscess prior to 1988 was 0.2 to 1.2 cases per 10,000 hospital admissions. But since 1988, this has gone up to about 12 and a half cases per 10,000 hospital admissions. And this incidence has increased secondary to the rise of IV drug abuse. So <clears throat> spinal epidural abscesses are localized to the cervical spine. About 18 to 36 percent uh, of spinal epidural abscess hospital admissions. And cervical epidural abscesses are associated with worse neurological outcomes and a higher incidence of morbidity and mortality. So when you look at the risk factors, as we discussed, IV drug use is the most common. Other risk factors include diabetes, obesity, chronic steroid use, immunosuppression, malignancy. And cervical specific risk factors include retropharyngeal abscesses and uh, patients with a history of neck radiation. Presenting, sim uh, presenting symptoms, uh, patients can present with neck pain, fever, nuclear rigidity. They may present with neurologic deficit in 45 to 77 percent of cases. Ventral location of a cervical epidural abscess is more likely to cause weakness. Labor uh, laboratory studies that you can order, ESR, CRP, white blood cell count, radiologic studies. Really the best radiologic study to order is going to be an MRI with and without contrast. In patients who cannot have an MRI, then you can order a CT myelogram, but an MRI is really the, uh, the best radiologic study to order. Location of cervical epidural abscesses is there ventral in 30 to 40% of the case, uh, of cases, dorsal 30 to 40% of the time, circumferential 20 to 30% of the time. The C56 and C67 levels are most commonly involved. And very importantly, that you can have additional lesions in other parts of the spine in approximately half of the cases. So, you know, whether someone comes in with a cervical, a thoracic, or lumbar epidural abscess, you really need to consider imaging their entire neuroaxis so you're not missing uh, an epidural abscess at another site not seen on your original study because uh, you can see additional lesions in approximately 50 percent of the time sources hematogenous uh, spread you have direct spread from the pharyngeal cavity urinary tract infection bacterial endocarditis you know some patients come in with epidural abscess and we can never find a source for that Staph is the most common organism with MSSA, more common than MRSA. Treatment, you can do medical treatment alone with IV antibiotics. Uh, these are, this is typically done in patients who are high risk for surgery uh, and or don't have any neurologic deficits. Uh, CT guided aspiration has also uh, been utilized. Uh, surgical evacuation is probably the more common and more definitive mode of treatment for cervical epidural abscess. Now, when you look at the literature, studies specifically addressing cervical epidural abscess are limited and of low quality. Uh, review of the available studies suggests that early surgery may improve neurological outcome and that medical treatment can be considered as an option, especially in patients who present uh, a risk for surgery. And Strixek and colleagues did a really nice uh, review of cervical uh, spinal epidural abscess, and this appeared and Global Spine Journal in 2018. Now, when you look at the medical legal aspects of spinal epidural abscess, again, this study is not cervical specific, but spinal epidural abscess in general. Shantram and colleagues uh, <clears throat> published in Orthopedic Reviews in 2018, physician and patients factors associated with outcome of, outcome of spinal epidural abscess related malpractice litigation. And they searched three large medical legal da databases, Verdict Search, Westlaw, and Lexis. And they were searched for spinal epidural abscess related malpractice cases. They came up with about 135 cases. Uh, about 22% of those were cases that settled. About 44% resulted in a defendant ruling. And about 35% resulted in a plaintiff ruling. And the mean award for a plaintiff ruling in this study was $4.3 million. The mean award for settled cases was about $2.3 million. So these are high dollar uh, cases that are awarded to the plaintiff for that settle. And plaintiff verdicts and monetary awards were not significantly related to the age or sex of uh, the patient. And a previously known infection was not significantly associated with proportion of plaintiff verdicts or indemnity payments. And 
Uh, plaintiff verdicts were more common for patients who became paraplegic or quadriplegic, not surprisingly, and were associated with significantly higher monetary awards relative to patients without paralysis. And so also in the study, we see that plaintiff verdicts were more common when cases had an associated delay in diagnosis or delay in treatment. The physicians most likely uh, sued in this study were internists about 15% of the time, anesthesiologists in about 10% of uh, the suits, and these are mostly the pain management physicians that uh, had an epidural abscess as a complication of a spinal injection. Uh, ER docs were sued in about 9% of the cases, and family medicine doctors sued in about 7% uh, of the cases. And so you know, look at the top four physicians sued, uh, three of those, the internist, the, the ER doc, and the family medicine uh, physician are the ones that are most likely to see these patients initially. And, and these are the cases that uh, most likely were a delay in treatment, and that's why uh, the, those physicians are, are being involved uh, in the lawsuit. Neurosurgeons and orthopedic surgeons were only sued in about 4.4% of the cases. Uh, multiple, multiple providers and 1.5%, and the remaining lawsuits were either against a hospital or another specialty not uh, mentioned here. So when you look at the literature on surgical timing and spinal epidural abscess, it's defined as either early, less than 24 hours, or delayed, uh, greater than 24 hours. Uh, Gobriel and colleagues uh, <clears throat> in their study titled, titled Timing in the Surgical Evaluation, Evacuation of Spinal Epidural Abscess, this occurred in Nurse Surgical Focus 2014 as a retrospective review of 87 patients with spinal epidural abscess, and they found that early surgery within 24 hours had a relative advantage to delayed surgery in regards to neurologic rate at discharge, but this was not statistically significant. Uh, Nancy Epstein uh, did a review of spinal epidural abscess, uh, appeared in neur uh, surgical neurology, and she found that the vast majority of the studies she reviewed advocated early surgery to achieve better outcomes for treating spinal epidural abscess. And this avoided the high failure rates that can, you can see with non-operative therapy uh, that can approach 41 to 42 and a half percent. And it also limited morbidity and mortality rates. So I'm just going to throw a case in here that I was involved in about three or four years ago. This was a 61-year-old female, and she was status post posterior cervical laminectomy infusion three months prior by another surgeon. She presented to our emergency room with a 24-hour history of progressive paraplasia. And other notes in her history was that four weeks after her initial surgery, she was treated with oral antibiotics for a draining wound, but she was never followed again by that surgeon. On her physical exam in the emergency room, when I came in to see her, she had flicker movement in the bilateral toes, otherwise no movement in the bilateral lower extremities. Her grip strength was about three out of five, tricep strength was about four out of five, uh, full motor and bilateral deltoid biceps. She had a T1 uh, sensory level uh, to pinprick. She was afebrile. Slightly elevated white count uh, in her laboratory data. She did have elevated ESR and CRP. So I went ahead and ordered MRI of the cervical spine with them out contrast, and this is what it showed. So I got called about midnight uh, to the ER for this patient for a T1 compression fracture. They didn't really notice that she wasn't moving her legs, but after examining her and getting the MRI, you see that this is a C7 T1 discitis osteomyelitis with epidural abscess and cord impingement. So I took her straight from the emergency room to the operating room uh, for 540 reconstruction. She already had C3 to T1 instrumentation in place. So went in from the back, took that out, did a laminectomy, bilateral C8, Smith-Peterson osteotomies, flipped her over, did anterior C7 and T1 corpectomy, and then a strut graph, uh, expandable cage from uh, C6 to T2 with plate, flipped her back over and did C3 to T3, uh, instrumented fusion. So she had an extended uh, inpatient rehab course, but eventually became ambulatory with assistive devices. One year post-op, she remained ambulatory with assistive devices and CT revealed solid fusion over her instrumented levels. So, you know, in conclusion, you got to look at this in, in, from a medical legal, a surgical timing, a location in the cervical spine of epidural abscess, and, and all the data that we just went through. And from a medical legal standpoint, we know that plaintiff verdicts are more common for patients to become paraplegic or quadriplegic and are associated with significantly higher monetary awards. We know that plaintiff verdicts are more common when cases have an associated delay in diagnosis or a delay in treatment. Surgical timing, early uh, surgery is associated with better outcomes in the, in the studies that have been reviewed. 
cervical epidural abscesses we know are associated with worse neurological outcomes and higher incidence of morbidity and mortality. And early surgery, you know, within 24 hours should be considered in all patients with cervical epidural abscess unless there is a very significant medical risk for surgery and the patients are neurologically intact. Thank you.